you've probably solved a maze at least once. Whether you were in school or you saw one in a newspaper, you've likely drawn that magical path from the start to the finish. But chances are, school didn't show you how mazes are actually made. And that's a shame, because there's so much cool math that goes into it. So let's explore that math and figure out how to generate a good maze. Then at the end of the video, I'll show you one of the most beautiful maze algorithms that I bet you've never seen before. In order to create a maze, it'll probably help if we have a good definition. The Google definition is pretty broad. It just says a network of paths. So I guess technically, almost anything could be a maze. Any shape, size, or dimension. But that's a headache, so let's make a new definition. Typically, a maze has a big square, or a border, with horizontal and vertical lines on the inside. Let's make that the first thing in our definition. Usually there's also a start and a finish, but I'll come back to that idea later. Getting more specific though, where are these lines allowed to be? Can they just be anywhere? Well, if you take a typical maze and continue the lines out, you'll get a grid of square cells. This means that every possible line must be somewhere on this grid. So let's add that to the definition as well. Okay, so a maze is just a grid of square cells with some parts that got removed. But this still isn't very specific. Which parts should be removed? Well, the thing that makes a maze a maze is that it has pathways. So naturally, let's remove the parts that create those pathways. One way to do this is to start at a cell, draw a pathway to another cell, and remove any segments that got in your way. Using this strategy, you can make pretty much any maze you want. Just trace out the pathways and remove any segments that intersect. Okay, now we're getting somewhere. A maze is a grid of cells and a set of pathways that remove segments. And the beautiful thing is, this definition works no matter how much or how little you remove. Even if you draw nothing and you leave it as a grid, then technically every cell is its own pathway, each represented by a single point. So I guess connecting cells isn't really drawing a pathway, rather it's merging pathways together to form a bigger one. Now obviously, a grid of single point pathways isn't a very exciting maze, but according to our definition, it's still a maze. It's a grid and a set of pathways. Okay, now we have a definition, but clearly not every maze is created equal. Under this definition, this is a maze, but so is this, and so is this. In some applications, that's fine, but remember, we want to figure out how to generate a good maze. So we need to define what good actually means. Take a look at these two mazes. Why is this one more fun? It has more connections, right? In fact, you can get from any point to any other point because there's just one big pathway. But if more connections means more fun, then why isn't this fun? The pathway in this maze has as many connections as possible. Okay, so a fun maze must be somewhere in between the two. You don't want to have zero options, but you also don't want to have too many. So how many options are in a typical maze, like in a newspaper? If you test it out, you'll probably find that there's always one option to get from any point to any other point. Not zero options, not two options, always one. That's the magic rule that makes it fun. And the more you play around with this rule, the more it makes sense. For example, having a loop in a maze is not very fun. At least if you're solving it in a video game, because you might run around in circles. Sure enough, loops break this rule. They give you multiple ways to get from A to B. Another thing that's not super fun is when there's an isolated area, because it's impossible to get to. Unsurprisingly, this also breaks the rule. Point A in one area can never get to point B in the other. Also, this rule makes the start and finish of a maze kind of arbitrary. No matter where you place them, you're guaranteed to have one path from the start to the finish. Let's go ahead and call a maze with this property a perfect maze. And no, I'm not just describing it with an adjective, that's actually what it's called. Alright, let's summarize. A grid of cells with a set of pathways is a maze, and if there's only one way to get from any cell to any other cell, it's also a perfect maze. Now let's take a step back and think about what this means for generation. The question of how to generate a good maze has now become how to generate a perfect maze. Where generating a perfect maze means connecting all the dots such that there's only one path from any dot to any other dot. And the generation really is just about those dots. You don't even have to think about the walls anymore if you don't want to. I mean, if you have a set of pathways, there's only one possible way to draw the walls around them. In other words, dots and connections, and walls, are two equivalent definitions of a maze. If you have dots and connections, you can get the walls back. 
If you have walls, you can get the dots and connections back. Okay, now here's where the math really kicks in. In mathematics, whenever you've reduced a problem down to just dots and connections, you're gonna have a lot of mathematicians yell at you to use graph theory. Graph theory is a sector of math that focuses on graphs, where a graph is just a set of vertices and edges, dots and connections. So this is a graph, and so is this, and so is this. Any set of vertices and edges is a graph. And if a graph has only one path from any vertex to any other vertex, then it's a special type of graph called a tree. This is where the power of graph theory can become a huge help. Any algorithm that someone has ever made to generate a tree can now be applied to perfect mazes. Well, okay, that's a bit of a lie. You can't use any tree. The edges have to be between adjacent vertices. But if you make a tree with that property, then congrats, you've made a perfect maze. If you look online, there are plenty of well-known algorithms to make these kinds of trees, but instead of looking at those, let's think about how you might have come up with them yourself. The first thing you might try is to start at a vertex and just randomly travel to adjacent neighbors, drawing edges as you go. This works pretty well at the start, but sooner or later, you might accidentally visit a vertex for the second time, which creates a loop. No problem though, let's just say that you can't pick a neighbor if you've already been there before, and continue running. Shoot, now it's stuck. All the neighbors are visited, but it hasn't covered the whole maze. So what do you do from here? Well, maybe by looking at why it got stuck more closely, it'll help brainstorm an idea. It got stuck because here, there were two options and it chose this one, which led to zero options. If it had chosen the right arrow instead, it would have been fine. But the thing is, that choice is still available. So how about we just go back in time? Let's retrace the steps until we're on that cell, and then have it choose the option it missed. Now it can keep going. Okay, it got stuck again, but no worries. Let's retrace the steps until we find another missed option. And it works. By revisiting the past, it eventually explores every possible option, visiting every vertex. This algorithm is called Depth First Search. It's called that because it searches as deep as it can first before going backwards. But of course, this is not the only way to generate a maze. Going backwards is cool, but is that really the only way to stop being stuck? What if instead you just search the entire maze manually to find an option? As soon as you find a visited cell that isn't already stuck, you can just continue from there. If it gets stuck again, search again. This also works. Eventually, you'll visit every vertex. This is called the hunt and kill algorithm. The advantage of hunt and kill is that you don't have to remember the path since there's no going backwards. But the disadvantage is that the repeated searching can take a lot of time, especially on big mazes. All right, so those are just two of the many perfect maze generation algorithms. If you wanna learn about more of them, there is a ton of information online, and I put some of my favorite links in the description. There are a million of these algorithms, and each one has its own unique pros and cons. But now, let's move on to what I mentioned way earlier in the video, a maze algorithm that I'm willing to bet you've never heard of. If it wasn't obvious from my profile picture, I usually post Minecraft videos. In fact, the whole reason I chose this topic was because I started making a maze generator in Minecraft. And as I was researching for that, I came across this video from another Minecraft YouTuber, Captain Luma, who made an ever-changing maze. It's a perfect maze that randomly closes and opens walls, yet remains a perfect maze at all times. So then I was like, oh cool, I wonder what algorithm it uses. Turns out, he literally invented the algorithm behind it, and even gave it a special name, Origin Shift. It's really cool, and I haven't been able to find anything else like it online. So let me show you how Origin Shift works. So far in this video, I've been representing perfect mazes as undirected trees, meaning that the edges don't have a direction to them. But you can also make a directed tree, where every edge points to a vertex. Now the tree kind of looks more like a road map. You might imagine starting at a vertex and following the arrows like their road markings. And in some cases, following the arrows will always take you to the same vertex. When a directed tree has this property, it's called a root-directed tree, where that vertex is the root. 
Luma noticed that any directed tree can be converted to a root directed tree by just picking a vertex to be the root and pointing all the edges towards it. Notice that when you do this, every vertex has exactly one outbound edge except for the root, which has none. And since you can basically pick this root at random, Luma thought, what if I move the root around? So the algorithm uses three steps to do this. First, point the root in a random direction. Then follow that direction and make that vertex the new root. And finally, remove the new root's outbound edge. This moves the root to a new location and it's guaranteed to still be a root directed tree, which means it's still a perfect maze. And yeah, that's all there is to it. The more you repeat this, the more the maze changes. If you run it for a really long time, you'll end up with something completely different than what you started with. One important note is that it doesn't necessarily change the maze on every iteration. For example, if the root moves from here to here, then only the edge's directions change, so the maze is the same. Whereas if it moves from here to here, there's a new edge and a change to the maze. Regardless though, this algorithm is beautiful. If there are any game developers out there who want an ever-changing maze, I think this is a really good option. And it gets even better, because you can also use this to generate a maze from scratch. All you have to do is start with a super simple perfect maze, like this, and just let it run. Eventually, it'll create a random looking perfect maze, just like any of the other algorithms. Coming up with an algorithm from scratch is not something that happens overnight. It takes consistent effort, learning and getting hands on for at least a little bit every day. That's why I like using the sponsor of this video, Brilliant. Brilliant is where you learn by doing, with thousands of interactive lessons in math, data analysis, programming, and AI. It's an online platform designed with activities on every single lesson, so it's a super effective way to learn. By solving real problems, you won't just memorize things, you'll build critical thinking skills that apply to anything else you want to learn. Putting in consistent effort is not just for making algorithms. Learning a little bit every day is super important for growth. Brilliant helps you do that with fun lessons that are available 24-7. If you like this video and you want some more math, then check out the measurement course. In this course, you'll apply visual problem solving techniques for deduction using symmetry and transformations. To try everything Brilliant has to offer for free for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash mapbatwings or click the link in the description. You'll also get 20% off an annual premium subscription.